All right, Alexander, we have an update with uh, what's going on. Boris Johnson in the UK, and I believe the he, he had the no confidence vote, and I believe the numbers were what were they two eleven uh, against one forty one or something like that. Um, quite quite a lot of uh, of uh, party members have no confidence in Boris Johnson. I mean, it was a pretty high turnout. Is is that correct or against? He, he but, still won. I mean, he he's he won, yeah. but yeah. Uh, I don't know. It seemed closer than I thought. But I don't know what's your take. Right. Well, the overwhelming consensus here in Britain is that Boris Johnson is toast. Now, can I just explain this? Yes, he won the he won the no confidence vote. Now, in any non confidence vote brought by the Conservative Parliamentary Party against a Conservative Prime Minister, every minister and every cabinet minister is going to vote for the Prime Minister. Now, that means that the Prime Minister has in his pocket, going into that vote, around 100 plus votes, because, you know, the number of ministers, cabinet ministers, parliamentary second secretaries, the so-called payroll vote, they're automatically going to vote for him. Because bear in mind, if they don't, they have to resign. They have to resign even before yeah, the vote happens. It is incompatible with being a minister in Boris Johnson's government that you vote against Boris Johnson. So he was the fact that he has in his pocket around 100, 100 to 120 MPs already, together with the fact that, you know, inevitably there's going to be some MPs who are going to stick by him, meant that it was inevitable, it was a certainty, a mathematical certainty that he was going to win this vote. I mean, it would be inconceivable that he would actually lose the vote. I mean, I thought groundswell might be really strong, might be enough people would come out and vote against him, but it didn't happen. Now, in the run-up, in the hours before the vote, the word was that if 133 Conservative MPs voted against Johnson, he would be mortally wounded politically. The actual number of Conservative MPs who voted against Boris Johnson was 148. In other words, 15 more than the critical margin. And he cannot survive now because it means that a majority of the backbenchers, that's to say the sort of backwards people, the people who are conservative MPs who don't have government uh, positions, they are now essentially saying we have lost confidence in this prime minister. And if you follow the British media this morning, they're all saying this, everybody's saying this, the former Conservative leader and Foreign Secretary William Hague has now said that Boris Johnson's premiership is unviable and there are others who are talking in the same way. So, and the interesting thing is that Johnson has lost support from every part of the Conservative Party, from the Brexiters, from the Remainers, from the left, from the right, from the centre. He's lost support from every part. And I think one thing that may have twisted the knife even further is that in the run-up to the vote yesterday, there was an article in the Daily Telegraph by Nigel Farage, <laughs> who some M Conservative MPs listen to, even if they don't admit it. But he also basically said, Boris Johnson must go. So Boris Johnson is mortally wounded politically. He cannot remain prime minister for much longer. He will have to resign, I think, within the next couple of weeks at most. Remember, when we went through this process with Theresa May, she took a, it took a, a little while. There was a vote of no confidence in her. She won it by a bigger margin than the one that Boris Johnson has won by. But nonetheless, it was clear from that moment on that she was mortally wounded, and so is Boris Johnson now. So I, I, I think that this premiership, this disastrous premiership, 
as it's turned out, this premiership which came in in such a strong way, he won the Brexit war, he won this big majority for the Conservatives in the general election, has unravelled at record speed. I mean, I've never known anything like it, but it has unravelled and we are now in its final days. Right, so he uh, placed all his uh, chips, he put all his bet on uh, Ukraine and it failed because of the 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 bash the backlash the boomerang effect of the sanctions at home coupled with all the actions that uh, that he took pre um, special military operation in reference to to the money printing and the lockdowns and all these things yeah I mean he did it to himself and, yes. and that's that's why he's uh, he, he's going to be out correct and then what is the process. When and if he is out, what what happens next? Is it the party right. votes? Is well, it an election, a general election? What, what's next? Right. Well, let, let's first of all talk about why he's lost, because you're absolutely right. Now, of course, no one in the media, everybody in the media, everyone in mainstream media in Britain supports supports the war, supports Ukraine. I mean, you cannot basically write in mainstream media. No editor will publish you if you criticise or oppose the war. But what has happened is that the war has triggered an economic crisis. And the biggest fall in living standards that we've experienced in Britain since records, modern records, start to started to be made in the 1950s. Now, a prime minister, a, 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 a political leader, can survive scandals. They can survive appearances of corruption and incompetence if living standards are rising and there's an impression that the economy is booming. The, the, the great example of this, to my mind, is Bill Clinton. You remember Bill Clinton in the 90s? We were getting more and more information about what a profoundly corrupt presidency that was. You remember there was the business with Monica Lewinsky. Remember there was the impeachment. But at the end of the day, people in the United States felt prosperous. The economy was doing well. That was buying him political support, Bill Clinton political support. There wasn't that interest in the events in the country. Um, and basically, he was able to, to survive. And if in Britain we'd been going through a similar period of prosperity, if people's living standards were rising, well, to be straightforward about it, they wouldn't be interested in Partygate. The fact that, you know, Boris Johnson was holding party. Well, they'd be interested. They'd be angry about it, but they wouldn't be so angry about it as to undermine the, his position as prime minister. Now, what has happened instead is that Boris Johnson played a major, a major role in orchestrating both the war and the sanctions. He didn't take into account what the effect of the sanctions would be. We have a major economic crisis in Britain. Things are going extremely bad. And the result is that the country has turned against him, and so has the Conservative Party, where he was never popular. So though the principle in Britain, when we're talking about this fall of the Prime Minister, is don't mention the war. In practice, the war is the cause behind it, just as it was for the collapse of the Estonian government a few days ago. So that's the first thing. Now, what happens? Um, at some point, I'm not sure exactly how, I'm not sure exactly when, but what you're going to see is a group of Conservative ministers, members of the Cabinet, are going to come along and tell Johnson, look, this, is, this has gone as far as it can, your premiership is sunk, the party is going to lose the election, we can't support you, if you try and cling on, we're going to start resigning, and at that point, even Johnson, who is, you know, given his due, a political fighter, will understand that. And he will resign as Conservative leader. Now, he will not resign as Prime Minister. Not at that point. There has to be someone to take over from him. And I'm afraid this is where it becomes very complicated. Because at that point, 
there has to be a conservative leadership election. And conservative leadership elections are extremely complicated and protracted affairs. If you go back to 2019, you remember that conservative members in the country um, have a right to vote. So this will take weeks. We will be without an effective prime minister for weeks. But eventually, someone will no doubt win that uh, um, uh, vote from conservative members. That person will then become conservative leader. And that person will then be proposed to the Queen uh, by Johnson, who will still be Prime Minister. He will be proposed, he or she will be proposed to the Queen as the successor, as the, as the new Prime Minister. And at that point, they will be appointed Prime Minister. If Johnson resigns tomorrow, which isn't, isn't going to happen, but if he resigns tomorrow, I suspect that the earliest date that we will see a new prime minister is August. And this, in the middle of an economic crisis, in the middle of a geopolitical crisis, with Ukraine going down to defeat, with the Russian army perhaps, who knows, advancing into central Ukraine, into Kiev, who knows what they might be doing by then. In the midst of all of this, Britain will be without an effective prime minister. But that's the situation we've got ourselves into. That's where we are today. Yeah. Boris really, really messed this one up in a big, big way. And so has the media. And uh, the media may not want to say that the war is uh, played a big role in, uh, in the collapse that we're seeing, not only in the Boris government, but in the UK economy. But uh, everyone in the UK, they either know it or they sense it. Everyone knows lockdowns plus sanctions against Russia. This is why we are where we are. They know it. The people know it. Um, yeah, I completely agree with yeah. you. So, so my final question is because the people really know why this is happening. And all people around the world know why this is happening. This is a big, major government that is uh, falling. The first big, major collective West government that has fallen due to the sanctions. Um, what are the other EU officials going to say as they look at the UK? What are the US, the Canadians? What are the collective le West leadership thinking right now as they see Boris collapse yeah. because of these shock and awe sh sanctions that they thought would lead to Putin's collapse? It, re it really, really reminds me, one final thought, it reminds me of that meme. I know you remember it during the whole Syria a uh, war that was taking place where you had all the world leaders coming out and giving speeches saying, Obama saying, Assad must go. And uh, and every single world, Angela Merkel, Assad must go. They were all saying, Assad must go, Assad must go, Assad must go. And at the end of the day, Assad is still there and all these other guys are gone. This is really the same thing. Putin must go, Putin must go. But now look, Boris Johnson is on his way out. Who's next? What are they all thinking? They're probably all thinking, I'm next if I don't That's find an off-ramp. That is exactly what they're thinking. Now, Macron has got through because he's just been re-elected president of France, but he's worrying now. He's apparently getting very stressed about the possibility that he could lose, his party could lose a majority in the parliamentary elections later this month. And it's looking like a distinct possibility. Everywhere else, we see collapse. We see there's, there's now increasing talk in Germany that the government there will fall. I mean, I've been, we've been predicting that it will probably fall at some point, uh, I mean, even from before the Ukrainian crisis, from the moment it was set up, it looked like uh, a very unstable and weak government. But it's now looking like it's going to fall and it's going to fall in a disorganized and chaotic way with all its various component parts abusing and criticizing each other. So, uh, and then we could see elections in Germany and that could lead to a wipeout of the SPD. Uh, whether the Greens will suffer a backlash, well, that's possible as well. But at the moment, the polls are not so bad for them. But we will see a collapse in Germany. We're seeing um, increasing signs in Italy that things are, are, are getting very unstable there as well and that that could result in a sweep by the right, by the brothers, who, of course, are strongly opposed to the war, 
And you're quite right, that's what they're all thinking. They're all saying to themselves, a major government, uh, uh, the leader of one of the most important governments of the West, the US's strongest ally, the country which, apart from Poland, apart from, you know, and of course Britain is a different category from Poland, um, that apart from Poland, Britain has been the strongest supporter of Ukraine the strongest supporter of sanctions. It was the British, it was Boris Johnson who lobbied most hard for the disconnection of Russian banks from SWIFT, for example. It was Boris Johnson who was lobbied for the oil embargo. He was the person who was pushing hardest for the EU to impose the oil ban and what's happened is that his political authority, his political position in Britain is in collapse. Now, whether these people in the EU grasp the fact that they need to change course fast, and if they have the uh, political ability to change course, I don't know. But certainly that's the lesson they should be taking away. Erdogan the Turkish president, who has some knowledge of these people. I mean, unlike us, he meets them on a fairly regular basis. He has said, and this is, he's actually said this publicly, he has said that they're all in panic. They're all in panic mode, that the war is going wrong, that the economy is going wrong, that they're running around like headless chickens with no idea what to do. And I, I think he's right. And of course, this affair in Britain, this collapse of a prime minister, is going to make them panic even more. Yeah, and it was also Boris Johnson that went to Kiev and uh, yeah. told Zelensky to not move forward with some sort of peace agreement. That was way, way back. It seems like it was ages ago. It was like two months. Oh, ago. absolutely! It was. It was. It was in another. It was in another universe. Or once upon a time, in another universe, long ago, it happened. It happened in March. <laughs> At the end of March, well, actually, he went there in April, but he telephoned, uh, it was in April that he telephoned, actually, it was in April that he telephoned Zelensky and actually that, that he went to Kiev eventually. So, but as I said, it seems like ages ago now, and it's just a few weeks ago. And my goodness, I mean, you know, in the, because, you know, John, Johnson, whatever he is, he's not a complete fool. I mean, I've said this many times. On the contrary, I think at some levels, he's even a clever man. There must be at some level some voice inside him who tells him, Boris, what did you do? Yeah. I wonder if we're going to be having some sort of uh, Zelensky curse coming up in say, the next month. Do you know what I mean? Like all those leaders who decided to, to really get behind Zelensky and really support him and go meet him in Kiev and do these unannounced trips to Kiev and all of this stuff. I wonder if you're going to have a little bit of a, of a backlash there and all these leaders are going to start <laughs> dropping off one by one. They're all going to start dropping off and it's going to be kind of an, an Alensky curse at the end of the day. Wouldn't, surpri wouldn't surprise me at all the curse of the mummy and the curse yeah, of Zelensky. Yeah, exactly. There you go. It'll be quite yeah, a film. Exactly. But I wouldn't be surprised in the slightest. And I, I'm going to say this. I mean, you know, this is a serious issue and perhaps one shouldn't laugh, but I am going to laugh because bluntly these people richly deserve it in a uh, in in a crisis that is so tragic these people have behaved w uh, uh, like comedians engaged in a low farce i mean they've not been states people statesmen stateswomen they've not they've not taken this problem seriously they've never understood the forces that they are you know un that they've unleashed and that they are playing with. They're now, as we discussed in, our pre in a previous program, they're now busy trying to find ways to get around their own oil embargo. <laughs> Something which I, mean, I, I have to say, I mean, it, it's, so, it's so crazy that, as I said, that in itself should tell you that these people are simply not uh, uh, serious people. And um, frankly, they deserve everything they get. Yeah. They're trying to find a way to get around their own oil embargo. It's, it's crazy. And, and, and you know, and, and Boris, he uh, talked about squandering a strong position. What, what an what a incredible fall. From, uh, no, from what an incredible he, yeah. when he, when he When he won his election, he was in a stronger position than any British prime minister since Tony Blair, since the, you know, the first two years of Tony Blair. 
he, he, he could have done great things. He was actually, in my opinion, in a stronger position than Blair was in because he won, a, he won with a bigger share of the vote than Blair did and he had a, a, an opposition that was much weaker, even weaker than the one that Blair faced. And he had massive amount of goodwill. He'd also won a very difficult political battle, you know, the Brexit war. Everything was there. All the, all the, all the pieces were in place for him to play a strong game and for him to change Britain. He could have changed Britain in the way that Clement Attlee did after the Second World War and in the way that Margaret Thatcher did in the 1980s. He had that rarely do opportunities come to a leader like they did to jo like they did for Johnson and he threw it all away i mean it, uh, it, it's it's it makes you it makes you want to i mean it makes you want to cry my, actually <laughs> my final question and for what he threw it all for all away for what for a, for a fight that the uk has nothing to do with zero well, they have no so, alliance with ukraine they have no connection to ukraine culturally, ethnically, religiously, historically. Yeah. I mean, just go yeah. down the list. They're, to Russia, Ukraine, zero. They have no dog in this fight at all. He threw it all away for what? You know, that's, that's the incredible part. Yeah. For what? What did well, they gain out well, of this? Zero, nothing. Zero, zero. Yeah. Well, the reason it happened is because Boris Johnson had no idea or vision for Britain. I mean, he had this massive opportunity, but he had no idea what to do with it. So he, he slipped into this Churchillian mode. Remember, he's written a biography of Churchill, and he thought he could play Churchill, and he thought it would be enough. Now, a real leader, Margaret Thatcher, always focused on reform in Britain, was very concerned about preserving the peace of Europe. And she always understood, for example, the centrality of peace with Russia. And she pursued a policy, as everybody remembers, of good relations with Russia. She would never have got herself or allowed Britain to get into this kind of mess. But she was, a, yes. you know, you may, you may feel all kinds of things about Thatcher. She yeah. still has provoked strong feelings with many people. But she was a real leader. Boris was not. And you're quite right. He threw it away for nothing. For an for a, for a argument in which Britain had no real interest. It, I mean, it's not our concern, ultimately, what happens in Donbass. I mean, it's a matter for the Ukrainians and the Russians. It shouldn't really concern us. The peace of Europe does. The state of the world economy does. All those things matter. You, Donbass, its status does not. Yep. This was very easily solved if Boris Johnson, one final thought, if he just came up to the podium and just said, we believe that President Zelensky should say Ukraine's going to be neutral and we urge France and Germany, who are signatories to the Minsk Accords, to implement them. And this whole thing would have been over and done with. Which is exactly what Margaret Thatcher would have done. <laughs> but he never did. All right, we'll leave it there. The Durant.locals.com and uh, the Durant shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.